Welcome to Soul Series. Welcome back to my Soul Series, our weekly half hour, to be able to delve into, you know, all things really spiritual, to challenge the, the status quo, that's what this show is all about, to connect to higher ground, and thereby elevate the value of our experience here and now. Uh, the here and now, you know, that's an expression that's achieved in almost, um, you know, cult-like status in our lexicon. But as in any case, when phrases are used and overused in a culture, sometimes they tend to lose their influence and their impact. And people just sort of toss about the here and the now as a reference in time without actually considering, I think, the, the magnitude of what those words really represent. Today, right now... I want to share with you somebody who has helped me along with millions of other people to really understand just why that phrase, the here and particularly the now, is not only vital, but is really all that there is. My guest today should be called, I guess, the father of the now, because Eckhart Tolle is um, widely recognized as one of the most original and inspiring spiritual teachers of our time. I personally think that uh, you are a prophet, Mr. Tolan, and I was uh, first introduced to your teachings back in two th in the year 2000 when uh, uh, actress Meg Ryan was on my show and she told me about this book. We were in a commercial break. I don't even know how the subject came up, but she mentioned the power of now and how it was really uh, having a big impact on her life. And so I went right out and I got the book right away. And uh, I put it in my magazine as one of on the old list. And I, I think I, I even listed as a favorite thing for Christmas for all of our viewers. The Power of Now, A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment, would have to be one of the most transformative books in, in my life. It's always by my bedside, no matter where I am. I carry it with me. I was just saying before I was introducing you, Eckhart, that I wished... I had my original, original, original copy because I've bought so many copies since the first copy. But my original, original copy, I had so many um, uh, yellow markings in it for highlighting every sentence. I just thought, well, why don't I just finish reading the book instead of highlighting everything? Welcome to, to our Soul Series. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Well, uh, there's so much I want to talk to you about. Uh, I know we're not going to get to all of it, so I just want to tell all of our listeners now, those of you who are um, big supporters, uh, seekers, and, and fans of his book, The Power of Now, that this conversation will be continued uh, next week. Uh, so today's discussion is really, I'm going to try to focus it on the now and the book, The Power of Now. I was so moved in the book when you said, you very in the very beginning of the book you said 29 years old having pondered suicide you were thinking this quote i cannot live with myself any longer this was the thought that kept repeating itself in my mind and then suddenly i became aware of what a peculiar thought that was am i one or two if i cannot live with myself there must be two of me the i and the self that i cannot live with Maybe I thought only one of them is real. I love this because it's really one of the first times I, I thought, yeah, that's right. When you say, I'm going to tell myself something, who is the I and who is the self? That's the fundamental question, is it not? Yes, that's right. The, um, most people are not aware that they have a, a little man or woman in their head that keeps talking and talking. So there's a voice in the head that's the ex internal dialogue that most people are completely identified with. And in my case, and in many people's case, the voice in the head is a predominantly unhappy one. So there's an enormous amount of unhappiness that is continuously generated by this unconscious internal dialogue. And at that moment, that night, a separation occurred inside me between the voice, which is the incessant uh, stream of thinking and the sense of self that had become identified with that voice in the head and a deeper sense of self that I later recognized as essentially consciousness itself rather than something that consciousness had become through thinking. 
So that night the separation occurred, and when I woke up the next morning I was completely at peace for the first time since my childhood, without understanding why. The understanding came much later. So the important point here is that it's essential for people to become aware that their thought processes and the sense of self that is derived from their thinking, which includes, of course, all one's memories, all one's conditioning, one's sense of self is a conceptual one that is derived from the past. So all the stream of thinking really is a con form of conditioning of the past. So it's essential for people to recognize that this voice is going on inside them incessantly and it's always a breakthrough when people for the first time realize here's my thinking, here are all the or the habitual thoughts that I've been having, repetitive thoughts, very often recurring negative thoughts, and they suddenly realize, and here I am knowing that these thoughts are going through my head. So the identification is suddenly broken, and that is for many people the first real spiritual breakthrough. Spiritual, as I see it, is not believing in this or that, but it's stepping out of identification with a stream of thinking. So you suddenly find there's another dimension deeper than thinking inside you. I sometimes call that stillness. Mm -hmm. It's an aware presence, just that. It's nothing to do with past or future. And that we could call also, it's, it's like waking up. That's why traditionally in many spiritual traditions they use the term awakening. Mm -hmm. So many people would tell you, well, what, what do you mean awakening? I'm awake already. But what is meant by awakening is that you wake up out of the stream of thinking. And when you wake up, you become present. A completely different dimension of consciousness is suddenly there. Well, I recall... Um, I. In, in Stillness Speaks, um, you talk about the awareness. Stillness Speaks, the book Stillness Speaks, is, is all about that awareness. Yes. And I love the line where you say, once you recognize, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, of course, um, that that voice and that you are the observer of that voice, that that very awareness is you. That's right. And, and not not the voice. So you recognize as essentially there's something inside you that has its place. It's the stream of thinking. Right. It's connected with the past. Mm -hmm. It contains all your memories. It mm -hmm. contains all reactive patterns. It contains old emotions and so on. They're all part of that. But essentially, it is not essentially who you are. And that's an amazing realization. Now, the mind, of course, may then ask, well, then tell me who I am. That's the big question. I'm talking to <laughs> Eckhart Tolle, uh, author of Power of Now. So what is the answer to that question? Well, the answer to that question is th who you are cannot be defined through thinking or through mental labels or mental definitions because it is beyond that. It is the very sense of beingness or presence that is there when you become conscious of the present moment. It's intrinsically one with what we call the present moment. You, I sometimes say, this, for some people might find this a little strange, but in essence, you and what we call the present moment at the most, at the deepest level, are one. <laughs> because you are the consciousness out of which everything comes. Every thought comes out of that consciousness that you are. Every thought disappears back into that space of consciousness that you are. So essentially you are a, a conscious, aware space. And all your sense perceptions, all your thinking, all your emotions happen, they come and go in that aware space. Space, yeah. yes. Well, did it feel like, Eckhart, when this happened to you that moment, of uh, realization where you realize the voice was separate from the awareness, that moment that you speak about in the beginning of the book, did it literally blow your mind? Yes, it did. But I didn't understand it. I just realized suddenly the next day I was at peace and I remained at peace. There was a deep sense of inner peace, although externally nothing had changed. 
So I knew something very drastic had happened, but it took me some years to actually understand what had happened. I, some years after, three years after this uh, transformation, I was talking to a Zen monk, <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh, he was telling me, he said, well, Zen basically is very simple. It's uh, you don't rely on thinking anymore. It means to to go beyond thinking. And I suddenly realized, oh, this is what has happened to me. That state that I felt was a state of inner peace was also a state of far less thinking than I had been doing before. All that unhappy thinking, all that repetitive thinking wasn't happening to me anymore. And so you have uh, often said in all of your books, you characterize thinking as a terrible affliction, even a disease, and that it's the greatest barrier to the power of now. But isn't to think to be human? I thought that's how we are different from other animals. That's right. Thinking can also be a powerful and wonderful tool. It only becomes an affliction if we are totally identified with thinking and we derive our sense of who we are from the stream of thinking. In that case, you're telling yourself continuously what I call sometimes the story of me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and in many people's case, it's an unhappy story. So they, they are continuously dwelling on the past, and there's nothing wrong with the past, but if there's complete self-identification with memory, then all your sense of who you are, your sense of identity, is then derived from the stream of thinking. And that's a dysfunctional and unhappy state. So when you step out of identification with that and you realize for the first time, I'm actually the presence behind thinking, Mm -hmm. then you are able to use thinking when it's helpful and needed, and it can be a wonderful thing. But you're no longer, I'll put it in, extreme terms, but it's true, you are no longer then possessed by the thinking mind. The thinking mind is then a servant or a helpful tool which you can use. It's useful for many situations in this world, Mm -hmm. but you can't find yourself in there. And also, if you can never be on the thinking mind, it interferes with relationships. It It creates continuous conflict in relationships if there is no sense of space in the relationship. Say that again, if there's no sense of space. No sense of space, that spacious, aware presence that you can bring to the relationship. For example, when you listen to someone, Mm -hmm. you listen to your partner or you listen to a friend or just an acquaintance, can you be there as the aware space that is listening or are you, while the other person is speaking, continuously thinking, preparing the next thing you're going to say? Are you judging and evaluating what you're hearing? Are you just interested in your own aims and purposes? Or can you be there as the space for the other person? And I would say that's the greatest gift you can give a person. It is especially important for parents and children, but also very important in intimate relationships. Can you be there as the space, the aware, conscious space for the other person? For example, while you listen to the other person, can you listen in that simple state of alertness in which you're not judging what you're listening to? You're then there as a presence rather than as a person. Right. <laughs> so there's a, the deeper level of awareness is there, and yeah. that's what I call the space. I was going to say, you offer them that space in which you allow yourself to be connected to whatever it is they are offering. That's right. There's no judgment in that space. That's right. You're not defining the other person, and that's an enormous gift that you can give to another person. You're not imposing mental labels, judgments, definitions on the other person. A funny thing, as, as you know, so many people love their pets. And there's an, for some, for many millions of people. So many that, people, I would be one of those people. Yes, me too. Okay. But now, for many people, that's the only area where they realize they can communicate and relate to another being, and that being is not judging them. Because the dog accepts you unconditionally as you are. I don't yeah. know if you've heard the saying, please, God make me into the person my dog thinks I am. (laughs) (laughs) 
So the people feel that sense of freedom when they relate to their pets because they are not being judged. <laughs> now, the, the animal, of course, is at a state prior to thinking, so that's why the animal can be there as the simple natural presence. But when a human being is there, the human being has moved beyond thinking, and that's the state of awareness. Well, but both these states are free of definitions and judgments. Jesus, of course, also talked a lot about the importance of not judging another person. Well, which, you know, because since the power of now, so many people have been introduced to the, to this very idea uh, that you presented to us in, in in this book, and you know, are are stimulated by the idea and. And even I have had glimpses of that space. Oh, I'm sure you have. Yeah, glimpses of that space. But how can you live in that space? You seem to live in that space. Yes. Well, first of all, it's important to acknowledge and to be grateful for the glimpses of it yes. when they happen. And then you can actually not just wait for the space to happen almost as a kind of grace that comes into your life, right. which sometimes does happen. Right. But you can also invite that space simply by bringing more presence into your life, which means more present moment awareness. For example, I recommend that people use little everyday activities that they do every day unconsciously and mm -hmm. bring a conscious presence. When you wash your hands, when you make a cup of coffee, when you walk across a room, down the stairs, you're in the elevator, waiting for the elevator. These are all opportunities for, instead of indulging in thinking, being there as a still alert presence. Yes, like a lot of people, you know, take showers in the morning. They're taking a shower, but they might as well already be in the office because they're thinking about, you know, getting in their car and what am I going to do today? And That's right. what, you know, what yes. is my to-do list? Yes. Instead of being present in the shower, feeling the water, the essence of the water, the moment, whatever. That's right. So it's bringing little spaces into your everyday life, as many spaces as possible. I say, for example, when you get into your car, shut the door and be there for just half a minute. Feel your breathing, perhaps feel the energy inside your body, look around, sky, the trees. It All it takes is half a minute. And the mind might tell you, I don't have time. Yes. <laughs> That's the mind talking to you. But I would suggest that even the busiest person has time for 30 seconds of space right. in, when they sit in their car, for example, or many other occasions. Well, you, I will have to tell you that uh, I think, it yes, it was. The year 2000, I first read this book. And many, many, many times this book has saved me. I mean, the theories in The Power of Now have saved me. And today, as a matter of fact, I had, uh, you know, one of the most hectic days. But yes. I remember waking up this morning thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be so stressed. I'm going to be so, so stressed. I let that go. I let those thoughts go and just thought I will just for every moment of the day be present now. Yes. That's a continuous refocusing on real what really matters, what matters most in anybody's life, which is always now, the present moment. People don't realize it, that that's really that's all there ever is. There is no past or future except as memory or anticipation in your mind. But that's what throws me, though, in the book when you say there's no past. Of course, th there, there has to be a past because... There are all of our memories. There are all these ways we defined ourselves. That's yes. our that's our past. Yes. On one level, you could say nobody can argue with the fact that there is such a thing as time. There is such a thing as future. Of course, we use time to meet here. We agreed on this particular time. We said right. we are going to meet on this day at that time. Otherwise, it would have been difficult. We might never have met. That's right. And you are hard to find <laughs> in all the different countries. I'm talking to Eckhart Tolle, author of Power of Now. But we agreed on this time, and we are here because this is now. That's right. So time, then, is something that we cannot do without. We could even say time is what dominates the entire this entire life that we experience here because this illusionary plane the, that we're on that's right right the, this i call it the surface level of reality Got is it. completely dominated by time which is the past and future in the continuous stream and people look to time very often for expecting that time will eventually 
fulfill them, time will eventually give them what they need, time will eventually give them happiness, and sometimes of course it does for a while, but essentially the true happiness you cannot find by looking to f into the future because it is intrinsically one with living deeply in the present moment. So it has been said <laughs> there are two ways of being unhappy. One is not getting what you want and the other is getting what you want. <laughs> right. Because if you think this, that or the other is going to make me happy, even when you get it and you haven't realized that the present moment is all you ever have, you will again be focusing on the next moment and always expecting, because it's a mental pattern that has is very deep-seated, always focusing, always expecting something in the next moment, never being fully in this moment. Well, another thing that changed me when I read The Power of Now over seven years ago was your um, com comments about the fact that all of our stresses, every stress that you have is based upon, uh, for the most part, thinking about what happened in the past or what should be happening in the future. That if you're able to take a deep breath, no matter what crisis is going on in your life, and look at what is happening now, hmm. in this moment, right now, That's I'm right. okay. That's right. Another way of putting it would be to say, when pe many people identify them, their whole, whole sense of self with problems, right. problems, they're continuously involved in problems. And so for many people, their whole sense of identity is intimately bound up with the problems they have or think they have. And often, just as a reality test, I tell people, just a moment, so I say, just say, f what problem do you actually have at this moment? Just focus, see what the problem you have at this, not, not in an hour's time or tomorrow morning, but what problem do you have now? And sometimes people would suddenly wake up when they hear that question because they have to realize, at this moment, I don't actually have a problem. What you might have is a challenge. If something, a danger arises, a wild animal, animal jumps into this room, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a challenge. And then, of course, it's not a problem because there's no time to make it into a problem. So f to, f for a problem to exist, you need time and you need mind activity, repetitive mind activity. In the present moment, there may be a challenge. That is true. There may even be pain. There may be an emotion but not what we call problem. So when people think, how do I get out of my problems? I suggest go into the present moment and see what is the problem now. And then you will always have to admit, well, right now, I don't actually have a problem. And people got that, even people who are in prison. I've had letters from people in prison, some are in for life, Mm -hmm. They've written to me and said, I understood your message and I have become free. And they meant free inside. Wow. Free of problem making. Yes. So, uh, yes, similar to uh, Viktor Frankl and, his, and Man's Search for Meaning. Yes. 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 Free of problem making. I want to ask you, you know, as I completed the book and have read and reread it many times over the years, portions of it, all of it, uh, listen to the tapes. I often wonder, do you live like this all the time? Are you always in the now? Yes, I'm basically in the now, surrendered to what happens. Occasionally, uh, if I see, for example, some, uh, somebody inflicting pain on somebody else or something, an emotion may come, anger may arise very briefly and then pass through. It doesn't link into the brain and, and creates ex an enormous amount of useless thinking. So emotions can come and go, but I'm basically in that state of surrender to what is. Wow. Because what is, is always already the case. So you can't really argue internally with what is, because if you do, you suffer. <laughs> well, what about... Um Having a, a, a does it leave you passionless for life though? Because whatever is is just going to be. No, no. Uh, in fact, you're more passionately alive when you are internally aligned with the present moment, hmm. which means 
you, you let go of this inner resistance, which on a mental level is judgment and complaining, mm -hmm. and on an emotional level is some kind of negativity. So these two go together. Many people have an enormous amount of complaining going on continuously in their mind. <laughs> some and, people do it out aloud all the time. And usually the complaining is about what was, yes. or what they wish was. Or what should be, but isn't yes. happening, and this shouldn't be happening, and you shouldn't do this, and I would, don't want to be here. <laughs> and so they always find something to complain about. And so they, these are ways of denying the present moment and that's a very dysfunctional state because you're basically denying life itself because outside of now there is no life all right then how do we plan for the future we're all told that we should plan for the future we shouldn't just be passive about the future no you should plan for the future and you don't need to lose yourself in the future if you plan for the future you can actually enjoy saying okay I, let's say I'm planning a trip or I'm planning a course of study and you write down what you have to do, the various steps, and you enjoy that. The question is, are you losing yourself in the future or are you simply using time and future on a practical level where it's fine, it has its place on the practical level. But if you think that some point that I'm going to reach in the future, now it might be the next vacation, or it might be when I find the ideal partner, or it might be when I get a better job or a better place to live or live in a more pleasant city or whatever it is, then I will finally be happy. And so yes, a continuous projection mentally away from the now, that's where you lose yourself in the future. And that's the dysfunction. Using uh, planning is actually fine. There's nothing dysfunctional about that. So, and that's the difference you could say between, as I call it, uh, clock time, which has its place in this world, right. and psychological time, which is the obsession, continuous obsession with past and future. When you say have its place in this world, do you feel that, you know, even now in the human body, uh, which is often uh, for a lot of people the pain body that you call it. Do you feel that you're you're straddling both worlds? Um, yes, you could say that. There's a yeah, it, there needs to be a balance between dealing with things in this world, which involves time and thinking, but not being totally trapped on this level of time and thinking. Not being totally trapped in time, and totally trapped in the stream of thinking, so that there is. A deeper dimension inside you that is actually outside of that stream of time and thinking and that's the inner stillness that's the inner peace and that is a deep vibrant sense of aliveness so you're actually very passionate about life in that state Wow that's what we're looking for here I just love talking to you one of my favorite books all time in the world the power of now Eckhart Tolle Thank, thank you so much for joining us this week, and we'll talk next week about one of my favorite things to discuss, the ego, which you speak so uh, profoundly about in, in your book, A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose. We'll, we'll join you again next week. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening. Thank you. Hi, welcome back to my Soul Series. So excited again because I get to talk to Eckhart Tolle. Um, last week we spoke of the power of now. He's a preeminent spiritual leader. I, I think he's a prophet for our time, for the 21st century, who believes that we are here to enable the divine purpose of the universe to unfold in us. That's uh, in the beginning of his book, The Power of Now. And uh, he's the author of that breakout bestseller. If you don't have it, it's one of the books that should be a part of your you know, personal library forever. I can't even tell you how many copies I've bought for everybody. And if you were to come to my house right now and you were going to spend the night in either bedroom at my house, it doesn't matter which bedroom you would go to, you'd find a copy of The Power Now, sometimes two or three, because when people leave, they like to take it with them. The Power of Now, A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment. And he's back to discuss his latest release, A New Earth, Awakening Your Life's Purpose. The inspiration for that title came from a Bible, a uh, prophecy in both the Old and New Testament, where it speaks of the collapse of the existing world order and the rising of a new heaven and a new earth, for those of you who are Bible readers. Well, The Power of Now is one of the most comprehensive and enlightening books, as you've heard me say, Eckhart, 
I've ever had the privilege to read. Why did you feel the need to write a follow-up? You, you really didn't have to write another word after, after The Power of Now. Well, that's true. Uh, the, the teaching evolved in the years after The Power of Now came out. I would travel around the world giving talks. And what happened then is this, some new approaches came, new perspectives on the same basic truths. It's not different truths. It's uh, focusing on the same basic truths, but new perspectives towards it. And also I felt the there was still something to be said about that which blocks the arising new consciousness in most human beings. Mm. So there's quite a bit in the in the book A New Earth about that in us which tends to block the awakened consciousness, the consciousness that wants to arise now. Uh, and one way of putting what that is is to describe it as I do in the book, uh, it's the human ego. Oh, I just, this is my favorite thing to talk about, the ego. Uh, you say the ego is destined to dissolve. How so? Well, first we need to see uh, clearly what the ego is, because sometimes people use that word and they mean different things. Yeah, they just uh, mean you're being arrogant or... That's right. Yes. It's, it goes, it's, it's a much wider thing. It's not just being selfish or being arrogant or thinking yourself superior. That's a small aspect of ego. Uh, ego is basically a self-identification with the stream of thinking. So that uh, collectively, I would say the beginning of ego is actually described at the beginning of the Old Testament, where there is the famous story of the apple, which mm -hmm. everybody knows, even non-Bible readers. So it, it is said there that they ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil. And that was when they lost that state that is externalized in the Bible and called paradise. What does that mean? To me, that means it is the arising of the ability to think and to differentiate between things. This is good. This is bad to make statements like that, to make judgments like that, which is to be able to tell good, is basically the ability to think, which is a myth. So this is a mythological uh, description of what happened to humanity. And at first, the ability to think was not entirely bad. They lost something. They lost a deeper state of connectedness. But I don't think that deeper state of connectedness with being was lost immediately, as it's described in the Bible. I believe it took a long, long time of increased thinking until people reached a point where they derived their entire sense of who they are from the stream of thinking. So what that looks like in a person's life is uh, there is a, there is a almost, one could say, a mind-made entity which is made up entirely of memories and past conditioning and mental concepts. And this entity, which really is all made up of thinking, people derive their sense of who they are from this mind-made entity. So it's a, it's a mind image of who I am. People have split themselves in two. They think there's me and there's myself. Me and my story. The ego is the story of me yeah. that people identify with. You say in the, in, in the New Earth, it's no, ego is no more than this. Identification with form, which primarily means thought forms. Yes, that's yeah. right. That's what the ego is. And you say if evil has any reality, and it has a relative, not an absolute reality. This is also its definition of evil, complete identification with form, yes. physical forms, thought forms, emotional forms. That's right. And that this results in a total unawareness of my connectedness with the whole, my intrinsic oneness with every other, as well as with the source. And this forgetfulness is original sin, suffering, or delusion. 
And that's, you know, when I heard that, I thought, yes, you're right. For every evil act we've ever heard described, or when we think of people as, you know, doing sinful things, it is because of a complete and utter disconnection, a lack of understanding that I am that person that I am uh, attempting to violate. I, yes. I, I am that which I am jealous of. I am that. Yes, yes. yes. It means you cannot sense the aliveness anymore that is in the other person. So you have desensitized yourself to the aliveness. Now, you can only do that if you've already done this to yourself, because by living through mental definitions of who you are, you desensitize yourself to the deeper aliveness of who you truly are beyond thinking. Okay. So you become... Uh, you, what arises then is a conceptual identity. I'm this, that, or the other. And then once you are trapped in your own conceptual identity, which is based on thinking and image making by the mind right. uh, on your past, then you do the same to others. You, and this is the beginning of that is always when you uh, pronounce judgments on another person and then you believe that judgment to be the truth, yes. calling people, la attaching labels to people. That's the beginning of desensitizing yourself to who that human being truly is. I'm having a conversation here with Eckhart Tolle, who is um, author of The Power of Now, of course, and A New Earth, Awakening to Your Life's Purpose. So if you are not your story, and most people, I do believe, think that they are. We live in a world where people believe I am my story. I, you know, was born in this family and this is where I was raised and these are the things that happened to me and this is what I did. If you are not your story, then who are you? Yeah, that's a very good question because you cannot deny, of course, that these things exist, right. that your memories of the past, things that you suffered, perhaps even things suffering that you might have inflicted on others and even not all suffering my family connections the people yes. i love yes you have a so-called past you have relationships all that is fine it is not problematic unless you become totally lost in that dimension alone so there's if you have no access to a deeper sense of aliveness or beingness beyond the stream of thinking because really, all that is based on memory. All your past, what, how do you experience your past? You experience your past as memories. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And what are memories? Memories are thoughts in your head. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're totally identified with all these thoughts in your head, then you are, you are completely trapped in your past history. There's no sense of anything beyond that in your life. Right. So the important thing is, is am I more than my personal history? Well, you speak in, in, in A New Earth, you speak um, about how advertisers are counting on us to believe in the labels and that we identify with uh, particularly in our society, exclusive labels. And the more exclusive the label, the more we identify with it. Yes, that's right, because the ego wants to be special, one way or another. Every ego wants to be special. And if the ego cannot be special by being superior to others, the ego would also be quite happy with being specially miserable. So you may have, you may have seen uh, business people who are saying one person says to the other, "I have a headache." The other person says, "You have a headache. I've had a headache for weeks." <laughs> <laughs> so people actually compete: who is more miserable, you or me? <laughs> That's another. It's just the ego that does that. It's just as big as the ego that says, "I'm superior to you," because the ego always wants to be special. So if you recognize in yourself that unconscious need to be special, then you're already half free because when you recognize the, all the patterns of the ego and specialness is one pattern of the ego, another pattern of the ego, it wants to be right all the time. Another pattern of the ego is it actually needs, it loves conflict with others. And that's an amazing thing. Of course, it's unconscious, 
because the ego defines it defines itself through a boundary that it draws between this is me and that is the other and that's an important word because you need the ego needs to uh, emphasize the otherness of the other person and that happens on a personal level when people are suspicious of other people's motives mm -hmm. and so on and there's a need to, for enemies which is deeply built into the ego the ego needs enemies because it defines itself through emphasizing the otherness of others and nations do it religions do it the the believer if you identify with one particular religion and for many people religion is only a mind structure not in its deepest sense but for many people a religion is an ideology that they identify with and then they need the non-believer the other because by having the other they feel their own sense of identity more strongly right and they need the other in order to feel their own sense of identity yes more strongly yes yeah. they need I enemies. thought it, you said did such a great great job of explaining this because you say it first starts with a baby when the baby first reaches for the toy and realizes uh, and the toy is taken away or not given to them and they say no that's mine that's right that that's is the, mine that's the beginning of identification with things identification with things and that what happens is is that we all just grow up and we just get bigger toys different toys that's right yes so it's always ego is always identification with one form or another. It could be a physical form, mm -hmm. uh, as a possession, my house, my car, and so on. So when you when you identified, your sense of who you are is in that thing. So and if that thing then is criticized, for example, by somebody else, you will become you will become extremely defensive or aggressive, because you're feeling your very sense of self is being threatened. Mm -hmm. And then there are other forms of identification, for example, my opinions, mind forms. Right. People I, have very strong identification with their mental positions. And I am right. I am right. And that implies, of course, that somebody else has to be wrong. Right. So that I can continue to be right. But tell me this, then I'm thinking this, that, you know, that as long as we are in this dense human form, Perhaps we we must need the ego. Otherwise, why we 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 have it? Otherwise, we would have evolved out of it. We are now evolving out of it. The, the ego has been there for thousands of years, and as you say, the fact that it was there for th has been there for thousands of years means it has its place right. in the evolution of humanity. So I'm not saying it should never have happened. The ego had its place because it was the the ability to think, develop more and more, so that gradually we became so identified with thinking that we lost a deeper connectedness with life, which is described as the paradise in the, old, in the beginning of the Old Testament, that deeper connectedness with life. We are now, I believe, at an evolutionary transition where many human beings, far more human beings than ever before, are able to grow out of go beyond ego into a new state of consciousness. Yes, you say that we face a very stark and daunting choice, and that is to either evolve or die. Yes. This is the point where the evolution of consciousness, the awakening of humanity is no longer a luxury, because now we've reached a point, if we don't grow out of the dysfunction of the ego, because the ego is now being amplified, the effects of this dysfunction are being amplified by technology. Right. So we, what we are doing to, our, to, to, to ourselves, to other, our fellow human beings and to the planet is becoming more and more destructive and devastating. Yes, I, I had a conversation actually with uh, Elie Wiesel uh, yesterday who was saying that this will, this will be known as the, um, the sixth century. Sick century yes 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 in our ability just to do the most evil and sickest of things to yes. one another yes I mean look at the 20th century it was dreadful the the worst ever in terms of human suffering inflicted on humans on by humans on other humans yes but we were saying that it doesn't seem that we learned we didn't learn we didn't learn 
it seems to have gotten even worse. And you were right, because of technology, because there are even greater bombs, guns that, and, 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 and ammunition that can kill from further distances. Yes. Now the question is, sometimes people ask me, are things actually getting better or worse? And my answer is, at the moment, th things are both getting better and worse, which means there are two streams in existence now. Hmm. One is the old stream, the old consciousness, the unenlightened, the unawakened, egoic consciousness, which is actually still continuing. You can see it a lot of the time when you watch the news in the evening. <laughs> you well, that see, is the, that is the consciousness. That's the old consciousness, old consciousness which yeah. is still just as mad as before, if not more mad. Well, the fact that we just repeat all the bad things that are happening in the world. That's right. That's one stream. The other stream is us sitting here now and talking, because that represents we are part of, I'm not saying we are special, but the fact that we are addressing this and the fact that many, many people are listening to this and it is meaningful to them means that there is another stream here which is the stream of humanity awakening and both are present at this time on the planet and as we choose to evolve you and I sitting here and everyone else who's listening to us and this conversation hits a nerve or has a moment and ah, I call them aha moments or they just find the conversation interesting and will cause them to look at life differently today. Um, as we do that, uh, are we actually creating a new earth? We are, first of all, what happens is a new state of consciousness arises. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's not so much that we now need to get busy and create a new earth because that would be premature. Many times humans have tried to create a new society or a utopia and they all failed miserably <laughs> so uh, look at communism it was it started with a good idea everybody is equal and see what it what it did create it, millions of people were killed in the name of communism so first of all the important thing is that we are open to the transformation of consciousness that is happening now out of that transformed consciousness, which in essence simply means we are no longer completely identified with thinking. We realize that inside ourselves there is a dimension in which I am conscious, I am present, I'm awake, I'm alert, but I'm simply an aware space. That's presence. I call it presence. You can have other words for it. Awareness, unconditioned consciousness stillness stillness that arises now in many human beings and so as that arises and gradually replaces identification with thinking and replaces relying on thinking exclusively to run your life there's actually in that stillness in that awareness there is a higher far greater intelligence at work. I know you say, I love how you say, uh, let us allow nature to teach us stillness. If you want to understand stillness, you know, stand beside a tree or watch a tree. Yes, that's a great help. Just watching a tree, a plant, and be there, just watch it, be there as the, as the aware presence that perceives the flower, the tree, the plant, the animal. Nature is always very helpful for people who want to connect with the stillness. Man-made things very often generate more thinking because they are made through thinking. So go to nature and then eventually it's important of course that you also are able to sustain the state of stillness even in the midst of a city. I actually enjoy, I'm in New York at the moment, I enjoy walking along the busy, busy streets with infernal noise and people rushing about and feeling actually in the background a deep sense of stillness. Really? And actually I can even enjoy all that movement. And it's wonderful to be able to be there as the stillness and not completely get drawn to into some reaction. It's like being in the world but not of it. That's exactly what it is. Being in the world but not of it. Yes. 
So tell us how we can get to be more like you. How can we not allow uh, ourselves to be dominated by the ego? I know it's a, it's a lifelong process, but just for those who are listening now, who are going to read A New Earth and read The Power of Now and come away thinking, okay, I'm inspired by that, stimulated by it. What can I begin to do today to not to have myself dominated by my ego? Yes. Now, the ego cannot survive in the stillness. That's important to realize. So that means invite stillness into your life. Now, that does not mean that stillness is something that you need to get from the outside or somehow create for yourself. It's realizing that everybody underneath the stream of thinking already has the stillness. Right. So you don't have to go to Hawaii and sit on a no, mountaintop. No. And you don't have to do anything to create it because essentially it's already there. And if you look very deeply into yourself and see where does my sense of I-ness, when people say I, they have this sense of I am essentially my, the, the deeper I. Where does that sense of I-ness come from? And then if you look very closely, you'll find it's actually intrinsically bound up with this, the dimension of stillness. So that's why I say in my book, uh, Stillness Speaks, you are never more essentially yourself than when you are still. So you invite stillness into your life. You can do it by taking a few conscious breaths many times during the day. Just observe your breath flowing in and out. Another way of bringing stillness or finding the stillness that's already there is feeling the aliveness of your body from within. I call that the inner body. Mm -hmm. And that immediately takes your attention away from the stream of thinking, a lot, as a lot of which is repetitive and useless, mm -hmm. and bring it into the body and feel, is there life in my hands? And then you f feel it. Oh, yes, very subtle, but it's there. Is there life in my feet, my legs, my arms? And then you feel that your entire inner body is pervaded by a sense of aliveness. And then that can serve as an anchor for remaining present when your attention, or part of your attention, remains in the inner body. Even at this very moment for people who are listening to us, they can practice it and they can see that even while they are conscious of the words that they hear, they're completely following what we are saying, mm -hmm. but it does not need to take up a hundred percent of their attention, they can have some of their attention, even as they sit there or stand there and listen, in the inner energy field of the body and feel there is an aliveness in every cell of the body. And that's a wonderful anchor for stillness and for presence. It doesn't mean you, you, can, you turn, your, turn completely away from the external world. It actually brings balance into your life between being still and being still being able to deal with things out here. It's finding the space in between. That's right. It's finding the space. It's like when you're reading the book. I remember reading the book uh, Power of Now for the first time, and you were saying it is the space in between. It's the awareness of what's on the page and the space in between that awareness. Yes. And you may also find, okay, talking about the space in between, that you may sometimes become aware when a thought has come to an end in your head, that between two thoughts there is a, a short, silent space. And when you acknowledge that, in, which means you suddenly become conscious that for a moment there's no thinking, then it, it becomes a little longer. It, it's, it's, and so you have a, a longer gap of stillness. Yeah. And then... Um, but if you become aware for so long you start thinking about it and then you lose it. Then you lose it the moment you say, oh look, I'm not thinking, then you're thinking again, of right, course. <laughs> right, right, yeah. right. Is there anyone on earth at this time who you think is free of the domination of the ego? First of all, are you free of the domination of the ego? I'm not identified with my thinking, which means I'm free of the domination of the ego. And there are many, many people right now who are going through this process. They may not yet be a hundred percent free, but they are going through the process in which they become gradually disidentified from the stream of compulsive thinking. I'm getting letters, emails every day from all over the world of people who are telling me how their lives have changed, sometimes just by reading the book, 
and how they become free of identification with their mind. They are not yet totally free, which means sometimes they fall back into ego. Sometimes they fall back into obsessive thinking, compulsive thinking, addictive thinking, because for many people thinking is basically an addiction. And then suddenly they wake up again. So it's a process that many, many people are now undergoing. I cannot tell you exactly how many, but my intuition is that in the Western world, about 10% of the adult population are, go, are at the beginning stages or a bit further, some further advanced of this process. Well, I love also how you say in the book, we're talking about, you know, the whole uh, uh, tone of the book is about awakening your life's purpose. A new earth is awakening your life's purpose. And you say that there are a lot of people who realize that how spiritual you are has nothing to do with what you believe, but everything to do with your state of consciousness. Yes, and that's, again, it's the stillness that's the spiritual dimension. It's not any thought. Thought in itself is not spiritual. Right. Thought can be sometimes helpful because it can be a pointer. For example, when and we say... beliefs are not spiritual. That's what I beliefs, learned from you. No, because beliefs, beliefs are, are not thoughts. Spiritual. No. Yeah. They, some beliefs can be helpful, but only as pointers. I mean, even if we say find the stillness that's already inside you. That's still a thought, but the thought is pointing beyond itself. Well, I love what you say that at the end of the book, that the foundation for a new earth is a new heaven, the awakened consciousness, because what did Jesus tell his disciples? That heaven is right here in the midst of you. Yes, that's a wonderful thing Jesus said. Heaven does not come with signs to be observed. You can't say, ah, there it is, or look, here it is, because it is essentially already within you, in the midst of you. The stillness. The stillness. All right. You, do you, can you believe another? We, we're out of time again. Next, uh, those of you who've been uh, so intrigued, so empowered by words that you've heard and read uh, over the years, and not just from listening to us, will have an opportunity to ask questions of Eckhart Tolle here on our Soul Series. Thank you again. Our listeners get to talk to you. That's going to be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for watching this video, my friends. I hope you really enjoyed it. Make sure you leave a comment below and please subscribe to this channel. I want to give you so much more. Thank you and I'll see you next time.